Hello, Chip GT here. And over the course of the next few videos, we are going to be going through the construction process of building a new back box to go from this to this. In this video, we're going to cover all, getting all the materials required to build the back box. We're gonna cover how to cut the wood, get it shaped to the right dimensions, adding in some features and assembling it and getting it ready to install components. Without any further delay, let's coin in and push that start button. As far as the shopping list goes, the biggest and most expensive thing that you're going to have to purchase is the wood. Now, I went around to a bunch of different stores. I went to Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards. Those are the ones that are around me. And uh, Home Depot had the most expensive wood and Menards had the cheapest wood. But what you're looking for is just a uh, three quarter inch by eight foot by four foot piece of cabinetry grade birch. And I found it for $69.99. And also, you know, while I was out looking for hardware, I knew that I needed to get some carriage bolts to attach the Bolly Williams uh, back box hinge set. And uh, with that, I needed some nuts and some washers. That's the first three items. These are not an item that you can find in like a box or anything. This is like they're in their hardware buckets. And if you go there, these are the numbers, the item numbers. And then I also needed to get a couple of special washers for the carriage bolts that attach to the cabinet. So there's the carriage bolts that attach to the back box and then the carriage bolt that attaches to the cabinet. Now, I already went ahead and got the carriage bolt and the nut from Pinball Life, but I didn't have like a spacer or a washer or anything like that. And then I also decided I was gonna get some felt pads and that's more for the artwork that'll come in the future. And you attach the felt pads to the washers and they are, they are in between the Bolly Williams hinges and your cabinet so that they doesn't ruin your artwork. So that's the shopping list all together. It came out to be about $90. Let's go ahead and we'll move on to cutting. First, I'm using a jigsaw for finer cuts into the four by eight piece of birch. Using the T-square clamp down gives me an edge to guide the jigsaw down the wood for a perfect cut. This new section I'm cutting is specifically for the three largest or tallest sections of the back box, the back panel and two side panels. This allows me to make sure that all the smaller components will fit on the other piece of the birch and gives me enough room for if I make a mistake or when I make a mistake and allows me to have some extra. I use the measure twice, cut once approach to make sure that everything is correct. From there, I go back to the original piece of wood, make some measurements for the top panel, and make the cuts. The top panel and the bottom panel are going to be the exact same dimensionally. So I use the top panel as a stencil to trace out the bottom panel and cut it out. Clamp the two side panels together using four clamps in each of the corners. In turning my belt sander upside down, sanded the edges till they were flush. This makes the two panels as identical as possible when doing it by hand, and I was able to get the panels down to the correct dimensions. I repeated this process for the top and bottom panels, and then using 150 grit sandpaper, I removed any remaining burrs, took some of the sharp edges down a little, and sanded down the outer and inner panels to prepare them for paint. Now that all the main panels have been cut, I need to start adding in some of the features. I start by adding all the pocket holes. The back panel is going to be the backbone of the back box. 
and will hold the other four sides. The top and bottom panels will also help hold on the side panels. I ended up contacting a friend of mine who had jigs for making rounded edges. After talking it over with him, we decided that the 25 guide was best and gave us a half inch rounded edges. This ended up being exactly what I was looking for. Next, I added three three inch holes to the bottom panel. This is where airflow will come in from the top and be pulled down through the cabinet and out the back of the cabinet. It also allows for cables to be routed from the cabinet to the back box. After that, I stacked the top panel and the back panel and used a one and a half inch bit to make the five vent holes, giving me a total of 10 vent holes. Some of those vent holes will actually be used for upper lighting like a beacon on the top of the back box. The drill bit ended up having a hard time cutting through both pieces at the same time. So I took, after it cut through all the way through the top panel, I took that off and I had guides to continue cutting through the back panel. Using a router and a T-molding bit, I made channels in the forward edges of the top and bottom panels. I figured I had more than enough T-molding, and I decided rather than having rubber bumpers like a stern cabinet for transport, that the T-molding would work just the same. I then cut channels into the side panels. This T-molding will eventually lock in artwork to the wood, and I did this more as a future-proofing thing than anything else. I ended up cutting a new top panel for the main cabinet as the old one needed to be replaced to accommodate cooling. Mating up this new panel with the bottom panel of the back box introduced me to a problem with wide body cabinets and standard size back boxes. I decided to press on and finish the panel features. I set up my table saw to allow a half inch deep channel to be cut into the top panel. This is used for the glass to allow it to be inserted into the back box. I then painted all the panel parts that would be visible from the outside except the outer side panels as these will be used for artwork in the future. Essentially, the problem that I had was the mounting hinges don't have enough of a gap to mount in the traditional outer manner. My first thought was to shave down the hinges, but this wouldn't have been enough as the gap was less than three quarters of an inch on each side. I noticed I had some scrap wood that was close to the dimensions of the carriage bolt head mounted flush with the hinges. It's about five millimeters. I measured out the scrap wood and turned it into a shim that will eventually hide the five millimeter gap between the cabinet and the back box. I lined up the hinges on the back box bottom panel so there was a quarter inch gap between the cabinet and the hinge. I marked out where the holes should be and then I lined up the bottom panel with the scrap and made the cut.
With the shim in place, I lined up the hinges again and noticed my first measurements forgot to accommodate a 5mm gap and I had to move the hinges back a little. I used a 3 8 of an inch drill bit to drill through the wood for the carriage bolts and attach the washers and nuts on the other side. I then clamped the shim down to the bottom panel and drilled 3 inch holes using the bottom panel as a guide. The next day, I noticed that overnight it had rained and the humidity was very high. This caused all the wood to warp just a little bit. Using four foot clamps to hold the top, back, and bottom panels together, I installed the first screws into the pocket holes for the top and bottom panel. Then I rotated the back box on its side and made sure it was flush with my work surface. Then I used the four foot clamps to apply pressure onto the wood to bend it back and one screw at a time mounted the top and bottom panels to the back panel. Next I aligned the left side panel and took several measurements to make sure the panel was mounted correctly and inserted the first screw. I then used the four foot clamp to make sure the front lip was then aligned and screwed in the other screw. I repeated this process for the other side of the panel and then repeated the whole process again for the right panel. Using the four foot clamps, I then put the screws into the mount of the back panel. When dealing with warp wood, make sure you take your time. It can be extremely frustrating. Take multiple measurements and try to do it right the first time. I reattached all the hinges and then I took a step back to look everything over and to clean it off a little bit. As a final touch, I decided to go ahead and put in the T-molding on the top and bottom panels. Then I added the T-molding to the side panels. When it came to the corners, I had to cut a couple of relief cuts, about three or four V-shaped relief cuts, so that I could round the turns. Once I got to the end, I trimmed it off a little bit and made sure that it was flush so that the seam was hidden. Then I took it inside for a test fit. In the next video, we will attach the cabinet and begin installing the rest of the components. If you found this video entertaining or helpful, please give it a like and subscribe, and share it with your friends to help my channel grow. Also, don't forget to ring the bell so you know when the next video comes out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.